WICC. Good evening, everybody, and welcome back, folks. Tom Snyder with you, friends, here on the Thursday night radio show out of Los Angeles, California, the 25th of June, 1992. And tonight we, we give it a go here with a story involving two, two principal players in the recent nomination and confirmation of Clarence Thomas to the Supreme Court of the United States. Joining us tonight is Tim Phelps. He's the co-author of Capital Games. This is the first full-length book out on the hearings involving the confirmation of Clarence Thomas and the confrontation that took place during those hearings by the law professor from the University of Oklahoma, uh, Dr. Anita Hill. For weeks, millions of people, a lot of us, watched the confirmation hearings to find out whether or not the allegations of sexual harassment were true and how the hearing would affect Clarence Thomas's nomination to the Supreme Court. As you recall, this battle sent men against women, blacks against white, left against right, Republicans against Democrats, reaching deep into our political system. Capital Gains, the Anita Hill Clarence Thomas confrontation on the Thursday night radio show. We are back and joined by Timothy Phelps, who is the Supreme Court reporter for New York Newsday. Uh, Timothy began his career at the Providence Journal in Rhode Island, then moved on to the St. Petersburg Times. He's also been a contributor to the Baltimore Sun and the New York Times. As a matter of fact, his coverage of the Clarence Thomas Anita Hill story earned him a Pulitzer Prize nomination, and he is the co-author of a new book out, uh, which is called, as I say, Capital Games. Timothy, thanks for coming in, and welcome to our show, young man. Thanks, Tom. You were one of those who knew quite early on that there were charges of sexual harassment underlying the nomination of Clarence Thomas to the Supreme Court. You knew that well in advance of the public. That's right. And where did you get that information? Well, I got it in, in the process of uh, calling everybody I could find who knew anything about Clarence Thomas, basic uh, shoe leather reporting. Right. And when you started making those phone calls, how far along was the Clarence Thomas nomination? Had it just been announced by, uh, it had just been announced, by yeah. President Bush? Yeah. All right. So this was before the hearings of the Judiciary Committee even began, the regular confirmation hearings that later evolved into the confrontation right. between right. these two. Who do you start to call when you're looking to find out about a Supreme Court nominee? Well, what I did was pretty basic. I got a hold of an old uh, a tele telephone manual from the EEOC, the agency that uh, Clarence Thomas was mm -hmm. chairman of, mm -hmm. and uh, I just uh, started going through the phone book, calling up uh, the names that I found at uh, the EEOC uh, some years before. And what do you say? Hi, I'm Tim Phelps. I'm a reporter. What can you tell me about? Are people forthcoming when you ask? Oh, that? some people hang up the the phone. Oh, they and, do. Yeah. Uh, uh, others uh, say, "Gee, I'd." Uh, I think that's an interesting subject I'd love to talk to you about. Okay. So. And at one point, do you come across the name of Anita Hill? Is that number in the phone book? Well, Anita Hill's number is in the phone book in, in Norman, Oklahoma, yes. Uh, but uh, I didn't call her right away. I uh, I, I knew that uh, she was not anxious to, to go public with her story, and mm -hmm. I, I kind of didn't want to scare her. So I I, uh, I stayed in touch with, with other people who were in touch with her. But at that point, she... Uh, she wasn't talking to anybody, and it wasn't until uh, several months later in, in September when, when I found out that she had uh, told her story to the, to the FBI mm -hmm. that I actually began to get the details of what uh, allegedly had happened. And how was that forthcoming to you, by calling the FBI, or did you get a copy of their report, or were you in contact with some members or staff to the judiciary. Well, of course, I, I, I can't talk about exactly I understand. I how, understand. how I got the information, but... Uh, well, I mean, you can, but you're not going to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a very fine line there. Well, the Senate tried for four months to get me I know, to it. I know. They weren't successful. I understand that. Anyway, l let me just go into the speculation here. Uh, once this story came out, there was all kinds of speculation as to who on the Judiciary Committee leaked it to the FBI. And it seemed that the, the ray of suspicion, the spotlight of suspicion, focused most strongly on the camps of Howard Metzenberg of Ohio and Edward Kennedy of Massachusetts. True? Uh, Metzenbaum and Kennedy, yes. Yeah, okay. I mean, do you know anything about that? Not that it's important to this particular case, but has it ever been nailed down as to where these charges came, or, or who first 
brought Anita Hill out, so to speak, and, and got her to the FBI. Do we know who that is? Well, yes. Uh, we go into this at, in, in some length in the book. Uh, the, the name of uh, Anita Hill was provided to the staffs of both Metzenbaum and Kennedy uh, early on in, in August, some uh, three months before the stuff became public. But at that point, uh, they didn't even touch it. It was, uh, it was uh, another month before the staffs of both senators uh, called her. And then when she did agree uh, to them to testify, they handed her over to uh, Chairman Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then nothing happened. Again, even though she had agreed to talk. Why not? Why the delay here of a month and more? Well, uh, several things. One, I, I don't think that the issue of sexual harassment was considered by the U.S. Senate to be in, in, in any big deal at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, the senators... As a matter of fact, it's something many of them do almost every day, I'm told. And I'm not trying to make a joke here. They call, uh, who is the old fellow from uh, South Carolina, Strom Thurmond? Uh, they call him Mr. Hands. Uh, there, are, there are women who, who will say that in elevators, every now and again, they feel a hand somewhere it shouldn't be, and there's old Strom. I mean, the guy's 86 years old, and his hand tends to wander. And they kind of put it off, well, he's old, he doesn't mean it, but this kind of stuff goes on back there. Well, uh, after all, one of the senators who voted on this uh, nomination is, uh, has just uh, stepped down because of allegations of uh, a very brutal sexual mm -hmm. harassment. Mm -hmm. um, and and this, uh, this the, leads me to the next point, which is that so many of the senators had their own scandals, uh, present or past, uh, to worry about, that they were not real anxious to bring up the moral... Uh, problems of, of a nominee. Right, or the alleged moral tur turpitude of Clarence Thomas in this case. That's right, that's right. It kind of, uh, we found that the Senate was, that w was kind of disabled from examining questions of this kind by its own individual scandal. But eventually it did go public. Yes, it, it, it never would have if, uh, if, uh, if reporters uh, hadn't gotten a hold of the information, though. It was basically... Uh, uh, deep sixed. Uh, finally, uh, uh, you, Nina Totenberg, and others. No, just the two of us. The two of you. That's right. There were, there were only two reporters who uh, who got the story. And uh, isn't it curious? And I don't mean to interrupt you here. That this story would surface through through the efforts of a Supreme Court beat reporter for New York Newsday, a newspaper. And Nina Totenberg, who I believe works for National Public Radio, yes. that the New York Times didn't have this, and uh, and NBC News didn't have this, and CNN didn't have this. It, it just interests me how how often print and public broadcast beats the media upon which or from which more people get their sources than any other. You know, you know what I'm saying here. Well, I, I mean, the, the great investigative report on why American democracy is on the dumper comes from two fellows who won the Pulitzer Prize on the Philadelphia Inquirer. You know, beat reporters, investigative reporters for print journalists. Well, there's some advantage, really, in being an outsider, I think. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm a newcomer to Washington. This was uh, my first uh, big story in Washington. I'm, I'm a foreign correspondent by experience. And, uh, and so I think coming in with a fresh eye, a fresh approach, and uh, the skills of a beat reporter, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think... Uh, I think uh, uh, provides a, a big advantage. You get uh, you get kind of used to things when you've been in Washington too long. And also you have a certain anonymity. Your face is not on the tube every night. Uh, you, you know what I'm saying? You know, Peter Jennings and, and Brokaw and Rather are larger than life and right. they can't operate right. with any kind right. of anonymity. Right. Anyway, what about all these allegations made by Anita Hill about Clarence Thomas? Uh, pornographic movies, uh, pubic hair on Coca-Cola cans, size of my genital organs. I mean, I sat watching these hearings along with the rest of America. I said, can this man who's uh, uh, nominee for the Supreme Court, considering his background and education, have these kind of interests? As it turns out, your research is, uh, has, uh, has uh, revealed that Clarence Thomas indeed had an interest in pornographic material, did he not? Yes. And this is a little embarrassing to go into because normally I, 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 I would say that uh, reporters have no business going into the private uh, interests of, uh, of public figures. No, they don't, except that in this particular case, that's, my that's friend, right. he may well make a ruling affecting your right and my right well, to not, engage not in... Well, not just that, but the, the, our, our feeling was that if indeed he had an unusual interest in pornographic films, as we, as we discovered... That, uh, that this partially corroborates what Anita Hill had to say. She, after all, was saying that he liked to talk to her about pornographic films. Mm -hmm. And in, in, 
in, indeed, he, uh, he had uh, spent a lot of time watching pornographic movies and telling his friends about it. A lot of time. Yes, m more, than, more I mean, than most people. I mean, and did this interest develop when he was a college student? Was it something he picked up in his youth? And We, we uh, talked to classmates of uh, Judge Thomas's at, uh, at Yale Law School who said that uh, every Friday he went down to the local porn theater, the, the, the seamy one, you know, yeah, 4X, yeah. um, uh, down, the, uh, down the street and, uh, and, and watched one of these films and came back and told everybody about it. That in itself really doesn't mean anything, but then when, right. you, when you attach it to the allegations made That's against right. him by Professor Hill, it does mean something. What about what about Anita Hill? What did you turn up on Anita Hill? Is she clean as a hound's tooth and all of this? And before you answer, let me do the commercial here and get it out of the way. We're talking with Timothy Phelps tonight, who covers the Supreme Court for Newsday. He's the co-author of Capital Games, Capital Games, the first book now on the hearings of Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill, the confrontation that took place in an extraordinary uh, addition to the confirmation hearings on Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. We'll be right back with Mr. Phelps and eventually some of you on the toll-free exchange after these messages from the local stations. We are back with Tim Phelps, the co-author of Capital Games, the story of Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill. What about uh, research and investigation into Anita Hill? That must have also been a parallel part of this book if you're looking at Clarence Thomas. Yes, it certainly was. Uh, we spent some time uh, 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 talking to her classmates from uh, from Yale Law School, and uh, to her friends, colleagues, and students in uh, in Oklahoma, um, we 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 learned one interesting thing about her that uh, that the public didn't find out during the hearings, which is that she's not a, a a Republican, she's not a conservative as she was portrayed at the time. She's a kind of mainstream liberal Democrat. Mm -hmm. So uh, some people may feel that they were misled about that, not by her, incidentally. But uh, otherwise, we found that uh, most of the people who know her describe her as perhaps the most honest person they'd ever met. Um, we, we found uh, no evidence of uh, psychological problems of fantasizing, as the Republicans uh, uh, said during the hearings. Um, and, and in fact, she's a leader of her community of uh, unusual standing. What about her loyalty to Clarence Thomas when he left, what was it, EEOC? He left the Department of Education. Or Department of Education to, to go to EEOC, and she went with him. And the question came up at the time, if all this harassment was going on, why wouldn't she be delighted to see him leave and go on to another station and get that part of her job out of her life? Did you, did you get anything on that at all? Well, I mean, I don't want to act as her spokesman here. I understand but, that. Um, we talked to a lot of experts on, on sexual harassment, and uh, um, we, we were told that uh, it's, uh, we're applying kind of a double standard, us men here. I mean, I, uh, all of us have worked for uh, people who we didn't uh, like for one reason or another, who were mean to us or unfair right. or stupid. Uh, and uh, and we put up with it because we wanted uh, to get ahead in our jobs, or we needed our the work, careers, or we or needed the work. We needed the money. Right. Um, Anita Anita Hill uh, liked the work that she was doing, and uh, and uh, was a career woman. And and I think that perhaps career women are are, are treated somehow differently still uh, in our minds than uh, than career men. And so she did. Uh, what was best for not for her but for her for career. her career in other words he was moving up the ladder so to speak right. and, she and she could she, go she with, with him, him. Right. She went with him right. now she says that uh, that the harassment had stopped some months before this move take took place and so she thought it was over and done with and uh, uh, with that uh, with that in mind went uh, went on but uh, I, I think it's le legitimate to say that this uh, this is enough to give one pause about her story but uh, those um, those experts who we talked to said it's really not unusual. After watching that, that, that whole thing that weekend last year, I am convinced that something happened between these two people. I, I don't know what it was. And I think that in his mind, he thinks he is giving an accurate portrayal of the events between them. And I think in her mind, she's giving an accurate portrayal of what on between them. And whatever it was we'll never know but 
at the time I said here, and you know, you talk with people in your life about this situation because it involved all of us for that weekend, you say, how could these two people not be together? I mean, they were b both well-educated African Americans. Uh, they both enjoyed their work in the service of the government. They both had, from all appearances at the time, similar beliefs, similar ideas, similar goals, even though he is conservative and she is not. I just wonder what you and your co-author found out in terms of that relationship. Was there a relationship between them? Not, uh, not, not that I know, no. Uh, I don't uh, subscribe to the theory, although it's, it's held by many people, that uh, somehow they were both telling the truth. In my view, uh, one of two things has happened. A man now sitting on the Supreme Court has perjured himself or an unprecedented uh, illegal campaign to sabotage a nomination has, has, has taken place. And really, uh, nobody in, uh, in a position of authority has done anything to get to the bottom of, uh, of, of, that, uh, of that question. Of course, how can we get to the bottom of it uh, if both sides are simply trying to protect their own political backsides, the Republicans and the Democrats? Obviously, and I'm sure you have information on this, the Democrats sought to use Anita Hill to bring this nomination down, uh, and they would stop at nothing. That was their agenda, to bring down the nomination. Actually, I think the opposite is true. The Democrats uh, um, uh, failed to uh, pursue this uh, story when they had the opportunity. And uh, uh, 100 senators in the U.S. Senate were about to vote on this nomination. Ninety-some of them didn't, had never heard of Anita Hill. Uh, so the Democrats have failed to pursue this. It's, it's not that they, uh, they, they tried to use it to, uh, to bring Clarence Thomas down. Well, I, I really think they did that last weekend. I, I really think they did. I mean, Metzenbaum, uh, Cole, uh, Kennedy uh, certainly brought Anita Hill before that committee, delayed the final confirmation vote. Uh, their idea was to, to, to uh, forestall this nomination. But but th that wouldn't have happened if uh, my story and Nina Totenberg's story hadn't hadn't appeared. Ah, uh, true, true. In the, yeah, you're right. In the beginning, okay. But once it was once it was public, once you and Miss Totenberg had brought this story public, it was picked up by all the media. Once Anita Hill was a living, breathing, mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, 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 person, the Democrats they, they had no choice. They had to run with it then. They had, it's just that they waited too long to run with it. If this had been part of the hearings from day one we probably would not have Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court today. That's right. But they, they didn't run with it very effectively. And, and as we say in the book, I think one reason is that they were embarrassed that uh, they hadn't taken the issue seriously before, and it made it difficult for them to pursue it uh, thoroughly uh, uh, later. Right. And as you point out in uh, uh, your book, uh, there were members of the Judiciary Committee on both sides who had enough in their own closets that they don't need to go after somebody else. Exactly. I, I have to pause here. We're talking with Timothy Phelps of Capital Games. We'll be right back after station identification. Thanks for listening, everybody. back joined tonight by Timothy Phelps, who is the uh, Supreme Court correspondent covering the uh, Supreme Court for Newsday, New York Newsday, the uh, newspaper, the co-author of Capital Games, the first book written on the hearings of Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill. I'll take your phone calls on this topic now at uh, area code 800 765 Well, the, uh, you know, I'm uh, dyslexic tonight. 756-0852. That's 800-756-0852. So what, what happens? Does, does this just go on now? Clarence Thomas serves on the Supreme Court. Anita Hill lives out her life in Oklahoma. She makes a speech occasionally, uh, possibly uh, appears on a feminist uh, program from time to time, continues her work at the U of O. And all this stuff at the hearing just kind of fades into memory after the television movie of Capital Games is made. Well, it could well be what happens. I, I, I think that uh, reporters like myself are going to continue to dog this story um, without... Uh, but, but, I mean, what's left on this story? What, what, what isn't done in this story? What, what's not done is establishing who was telling the truth. And uh, I, I personally am one of, I think, a minority of people who thinks that that can be done. How? By 
talking to people by going back and doing the same things I, I started to do in the first place. I understand that, but how can you establish something that happened in a room occupied by only two people and it winds up he said, she said? That's tough stuff to prove, Tim. Yeah, well, uh, we probably can't do that, but if, uh, if there are other people out there who were harassed by Clarence Thomas, I don't know what the threshold is, but it, it, if, uh, if I were to find four other women who, uh, who were harassed, you'd probably believe that Anita Hill was telling the truth. Well, I, I believe Anita Hill was telling the truth now. If, if, I, if I were asked on the rack, who do you think was telling the truth, I, I come down on the side of Anita Hill. I didn't believe Clarence Thomas, and he lost me when he said I didn't even watch your testimony. I mean, if I were him, the first thing I'd do is watch what this woman is saying about me. I would want right. to know every right. word she said right. about me. There's, uh, there's also uh, uh, you know, other allegations uh, that he hasn't told the truth in other formats, including in the first set of hearings when he said he never discussed Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. So I think if we investigate the issue of sexual harassment regarding Clarence Thomas, if we investigate uh, whether or not anyone else was lying uh, before the committee besides one of the two principals, if we... Uh, if we investigate whether he told the truth about other things, I think that we can uh, put this uh, picture together a lot better than, than we have so far. It'll take a long time. You see, there's another question to be asked here, and that is, what kind of people are presidents nominating to the Supreme Court of the United States? Well, exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, you know, people are concerned, well, the court's too liberal, the court's too conservative, and the court does swing back and forth depending upon what kind of political animal lives in the White House. But wasn't there a time when <clears throat> presidents sought to achieve some kind of balance on the Supreme Court? You know, Dwight Eisenhower, I mean, I'm sure he never knew that Earl Warren was going to turn out to be Earl Warren. But he certainly must have known from, uh, from uh, Warren's political record in California, where he was not that conservative a man, that the, some, liber some liberalism lived within him. Uh, Kennedy made some appointments of very conservative people. Uh, the present uh, uh, president seems to want to cast this Supreme Court in only one hue, and that's conservative. Well, Ronald Reagan and, uh, and George Bush have basically given the court to the far right. And uh, as, as we say in the book, uh, the, the day that Thurgood Marshall resigned, uh, John Sununu, the chief of staff, called up uh, Tom Jipping, a man uh, who was the representative there of... Uh, of uh, a coalition of ultra-right organizations and said, who do you want on the court? The answer came back by fax an hour later to the White House, we want Clarence Thomas. And uh, so what's changed is that people are not really being chosen by their qualifications. They're not being chosen because they're giants in the law. They're being chosen because they have the right ideology. And nobody Nobody questions the authority of the, of, the, of the president, the right of the president, to uh, appoint people of their own political persuasion. But uh, uh, people are being chosen who don't represent even the mainstream of, the, of their views for political purposes. So if Sununu sent the message out, who do you want? And the answer came back, we want Clarence Thomas. Then the whole party line from the White House that we're going over a list of potential nominees, the president's considering a list of potential people, that was all BS. Well, there was, there was, there was a bit of a, a, um, a, a disagreement, state, uh, yeah. disagreement within the White House over whether this was a good idea. I mean, uh, uh, the Attorney General, uh, Mr. Thornburg, argued that this might not be politically wise, that he would be very controversial, and uh, they talked a little bit about nominating an Hispanic American instead. But uh, uh, the, the conservatives in the White House, uh, uh, no, notably uh, Boyd and Gray, the, uh, the uh, counsel to the president, were adamant that it be uh, Clarence Thomas. We are joined now by Ann in uh, Yakima, Washington. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Yes. Well, I never believed Anita Hill for a minute, and I think she was pressured into this. And when Nina Totenberg called the senator the F word several times. But my question has always been, John Danforth has always been his mentor. He, he's known him since of oh, 20-some years. He would certainly have never stood up and made a passion plea before the Senate if he did not feel that this man was a good man because Danforth, I have read, is the most respected senator and there is, and he's a Episcopal minister, maybe good or bad, but he's a 
such a, has such an excellent reputation, and when he could, went and gave a passion plea, I can't imagine that he didn't fully um, respect Clarence Thomas and for what he stood. Can you comment on that? Sure. Uh, there's no question that uh, uh, Senator Danforth is respected and, and was very sincere in his uh, support for Clarence Thomas. But let me tell you two little items. One, I asked uh, Senator Danforth uh, during the summer after this nomination uh, about uh, what, what seemed to be a big difference between his views, uh, Senator Danforth's views on, on, on affirmative action and, uh, and Clarence Thomas's views. And he turned and he said to me, you know, I've never discussed that subject with Clarence Thomas. It's, it's, it's my impression that uh, although uh, Senator Danforth hired Clarence Thomas, that he didn't know too much about his politics uh, uh, and didn't really know the man as well, perhaps, as, as he thought he did. And one other point. Uh, when Anita Hill's charges were, were, uh, were made public, Senator Danforth's uh, uh, impassioned speech on the Senate floor included... Uh, the, the admission that he had not read uh, the FBI report on the Nita Hill statement, nor had he read her statement to the Judiciary Committee. And so he, uh, by his own admission, he really didn't, uh, wasn't willing to, uh, to look into it at all. Well, uh, everybody has uh, certainly put down Clarence Thomas on because he had discussed something and now so Danforth had, did not know his affirmative action, which is a rather neutral subject. But uh, Anita Hill, when she came to those hearings, she looked very somber, very serious, very, oh, um, abused. And yet when she, on the following week, was having a press conference in her hometown there, or in Oklahoma, she kept the press waiting for an hour. She came in in bright clothes. She came in smiling, laughing, a wholly, whole different personality. And I had the feeling that she thought she was going to be the person who was going to keep someone from the uh, on the Supreme Court. So I've never believed her at all. Right, except that except that by the time she held that press conference in uh, Oklahoma, Clarence Thomas already had been confirmed to the Supreme Court. I don't think so. Not the first one. Oh, I can I can tell you that. Uh, Anita Hill wanted no part of, of bringing down Clarence Thomas. I'd been calling her for weeks, trying to get her to, uh, to go public with this story. And she was a woman in, in terrible anguish because she, she did not uh, want to go public with this information. She had no political agenda. I, I can tell you that from my own personal experience. Well, then why is she now charging $10,000, $25,000 a, a pop and that when they, they were going to raise money for... Uh, a, a finance a chair or whatever the phrase is for her back there when they found out when she found out they weren't going to pay her the ten thousand dollars she refused to come and speak like she had originally I, I i don't know that that's true i haven't heard no that. this is this is stuff coming from the american spectator magazine by my close personal friend i just i really is not r emmett tyrrell i'm suspicious of any guy whose first name is an initial in fact if you look back in history at people who have really screwed it up uh, trust me on this. Their first name is usually an initial, like J. Danforth Quayle. We will continue with um, the author of Capital Games. The co-author Tim Phelps is with us tonight. Uh, we will continue with more of your calls on the subject of the Clarence Thomas Anita Hill confrontation uh, before the entire country last year. We'll be right back after station identification. All right, we're back. Here's Peter in Orlando. Hello. Hello there. Hi, Peter. Tom, I've always enjoyed listening to your show. I Thanks. can say I've always agreed with your politics. That's okay. But it's, uh, it's interesting to hear what the other half is saying about the, about the topics of the day. My, my, two, my two comments, I guess, are comments that lend themselves to questions. Okay. The first is, uh, to Mr. Phelps, are you going to go ahead and, um, and, uh, and, and give us the, uh, the big scoop? And in my mind, the big scoop is who released that FBI report, which Senate staffer, well, let, let that slip out of their hands, because frankly, that was not to be publicly disclosed. And in my mind, that was the greatest breach of ethics that transpired in this entire debased process. And, 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 it's kind of, and that, that's a comment and a question, I guess. I, I don't expect an answer. But the, the well, wait, wait. Let's see if there's an answer. Hold on. This is the $64 question here. Well, well, the answer is no. <laughs> the, well, of course not. I mean... You know, you got to protect your sources and whatnot. And now we have a, well, there, was, there was a Senate investigation that was allowed to peter out 
right? Without by by letting the funding expire, it just kind of just kind of died on that point. Uh, it's worth pointing out, of course, that the Democrats um, let that let that happen. They don't really want to have to. Oh, the Republicans let it happen too. Uh, uh, it, yeah. it was a joint resolution that was uh, uh, um, supported by both sides that there be an investigation of 120 days. They spent right. uh, close to a million dollars of your money to uh, no subpoena to, power. To, oh, they did have a subpoena power. I can tell you that because I was subpoenaed. Well, you, well, that was, well it, it's. You, you you were able to go ahead and protect your sources. I mean, uh, ba based on your, your status as a as a member of the Fourth Estate. My next question, though, however, uh, it it, it kind of departs from that. It relates to the whole issue of going ahead and giving the benefit of the doubt to the accused. And I know uh, a gentleman of, of, of Mr. Snyder's elk and your Mr. and your elk, Mr. Phelps, uh, are more than willing to give the presumption of innocence um, in most circumstances. Case. I find you both kind of agreeing with each other. It's like the, the choir preaching to the, the chorus, so to speak, that, that, that the accuser is is got to be right in this case. And, uh, frankly, it, it's a given that the accused, Mr. Thomas, um, is, is the one who's really at fault. And, frankly, I think that it, it's only fair in this case to give the benefit of the doubt to Mr. Thomas. Well, the presumption, in my view, was with Thomas in my head and my heart before his confrontation with, with Ms. Hill before the committee. After hearing her testimony, after reading the, uh, the the revelations contained in the book produced by my guest here tonight, Mr. Phelps, uh, substantiating his uh, his interest in, if not his obsession with pornographic films in college, going back to his classmates, breaking what about... What about that? I mean, this, 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 this obsession with pornographic films. I've heard that there's been conversations with unnamed individuals who said that Mr. Thomas would, would come home on Friday nights and discuss these films which I find incredible when you consider the fact that he's a law student, number one, mm -hmm. apparently had never discussed Roe versus Wade, and I mean, which was one of the seminal cases that any law student will ever deal with. Mm -hmm. And what is there to talk about about a pornographic movie? I mean, you have... Uh, you I'll, have tell you, I'll tell you what there is to talk about. I'm going to be watching very carefully because sometime uh, during the tenure of Clarence Thomas as a Supreme Court justice, a case will come before the court involving pornographic material, uh, pornographic motion pictures, uh, whether or not certain books or, or motion pictures uh, should be allowed to be seen by the public. And I'm going to be watching his ruling very carefully. And if this guy comes down on the side of saying the, that, he, that he believes that certain kinds of motion pictures may be harmful and should not be viewed by the general public, I mean, I'm going to call this guy the biggest hypocrite that ever walked. Well, wait a minute. Let's go back to Mr. Phelps just for a okay. brief moment. Okay. Uh, well, let, let's go back to your original point, which I, mean, I think is an interesting one. With individuals. I mean, is that an individual or several individuals? I don't oh, there, know. Uh, there, were, there, were, uh, there were several named individuals, actually, uh, classmates uh, uh, and friends of Clarence Thomas. Of friends, quote-unquote. And these are individuals whose names are mentioned in the book. Yes. And they've come out in... Well, I guess that's something worth worth, worth putting in your... Uh... Well, it's it's worth putting in the mix. And as I say, hey, listen, if Clarence Thomas wants to view a nudie cutie, I got no problem with that. Yeah. The, the only problem I have with it, my friend, is if all of a sudden this man is deciding what you and I and Tim can look at, uh, and he says, no, 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 we can't look at those things, but wait a second, Clarence, you looked at him. There's, there, there's a conflict there, in my view. I could be wrong, but in my mind, there's a conflict there. I guess it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But, I, I mean, when you go ahead and look at the totality of the circumstances, uh, the passage of time, uh, the fact that she stayed with him, even assuming some untoward comments were made, that does not make sexual harassment because the claim has to be brought within six months. It might shine something on his character, but you've got to stack up whatever that she's saying and her credibility against his years and years and years of public service and a leader and an example to the black community. Um, I, think it's been, I think it's been a real shame. And uh, I think a real, a real possible uh, uh, idol, a real possible uh, example for other blacks to follow uh, has been tarnished. Uh, but if you I accept what you say, that maybe he did make a few comments, uh, okay, in, in your view, that's no big deal uh, uh, in terms of sexual harassment. But uh, uh, the real issue here is that if, if what you uh, suggest is true, then we have a perjurer on the Supreme Court. I have to pause here for uh, the sponsors. We're talking with Timothy Phelps, who is the co-author with Capital of uh, Capital Games. We will continue with uh, Mr. Phelps, and if I have time, more of you on the toll-free exchange right after these messages. We are back chatting tonight with Timothy Phelps, who, along with Helen Winternitz, is the author, co-author of um, 
Capital Games, the first full-length book on the story behind Clarence Thomas, Anita Hill, and their confrontation. While I have you here, because you do cover the Supreme Court on a regular basis, just your take on the decisions yesterday involving uh, allowing people in some cases to uh, move against tobacco companies for injury caused to smokers, and the decision to uphold the uh, prescription against prayer in public schools. Yeah, it shows that this court uh, can can still surprise us. Uh, people say, well, it's a conservative court, and uh, there's no uh, uh, n nothing to uh, to surprise us at all anymore. But uh, the court uh, ruled five to four, very narrow, uh, very very close. Uh, call there that uh, that prayers at a at a high school or middle school graduation ceremony uh, w even non-sectarian prayers were were not to be permitted and uh, the court had been expected to kind of loosen the rules about prayer in the, in the schools but uh, with uh, with the help of uh, of justice uh, Souter who, uh, which, by the way, was a surprising vote to many people, including me. It was. It was. Justice I, I, Souter I would is, expect him to come down for school prayer, considering what we were told mm -hmm, told about mm -hmm, him before he mm -hmm, took the bench. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, it's it's interesting comparing uh, his nomination process with that of uh, Judge Thomas. Uh, people say the Democrats are out to get anybody that uh, that the president puts forward, but uh, uh, Justice Souter was approved almost unanimously by the Senate. He is a man with uh, a lot of experience in the law a lot of versatility with the law, um, with a, uh, a personality that, uh, that, uh, that everybody liked, and uh, he sailed through the Senate, and, and while he's been conservative, he's, uh, he's proven himself to be a, a thinking conservative who, uh, who takes each case at, the to at, uh, at a time. Um, in your view, he knows the law? Yes. Did we miss a great one in Bob Bork? Well, there's no question that uh, Judge Bork uh, has a tremendous legal mind and and uh, was uh, was as qualified in that sense as uh, as any nominee in recent history i mean the problem is that he had uh, a very extreme ideology and uh, a, a very narrow view of the bill of rights and uh, uh, that uh, his views were uh, were a little uh, uh, scary really and uh, and even some uh, some conservatives uh, have decided that maybe he wouldn't be uh, su such a great asset to the court, but there was no question about his qualifications mm -hmm. for the job. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your time tonight, Timothy. I know you've had a long day working here in Southern California on behalf of the work done by you and uh, Helen Winternitz, and I thank you again for joining us this evening. Thanks very much, My Tom. pleasure. Mr. Timothy Phelps, who covers the Supreme Court of the United States for New York Newsday, the newspaper back in Manhattan and Long Island, and the author, along with Helen, of a new book called Capital Games, the story of Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill. Coming up, all of you, on the toll-free exchange, this is the Thursday Night Radio Show. Thanks for listening, everybody.